Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, it's a really great honor to be back here again. This is such a, a great conference. Um, uh, if you're, if anything in here you want to talk to me about, uh, this is how you can reach me on Twitter. Um, my website is uh, a site. You can check it out. Uh, so I'm currently working at a company called uh, Citus Data, and what they do is it's a Postgres extension that lets you, it takes care of all the sharding, and so you can have re regular tables, but you can say, this table, I want this sharded amongst, you know, several machines, and that way you can have lots and lots of data. Uh, it's pretty cool if you use Postgres and you have or will have a lot of data, come talk to me. If that's not something you want to work on, come talk to me. If you don't use Postgres, uh, hmm. okay. <laughs> um, so this talk, uh, is going to be sort of in a, a couple different parts. The first part is uh, what, what is cr the crystal programming language, why I'm excited about it, and then the last part is going to be some examples to show you how it's similar and how it's uh, different from Ruby. Last week, uh, the crystal people put out a new thing where you can type at the command line crystal play, and it pops open a browser, and you can sort of like do live interactive things, and I thought this is really cool. And so I, I hacked it up a little bit uh, with the help of one of the uh, members of the crystal core team, and it's not released yet, but in the next version of Crystal, there'll be this way that you can have like a workbook, and so you can have little samples that go along with your library or whatnot, and so I switched the talk to use that instead. Uh, the good side is that I think it's gonna be a little more interesting uh, to see the code actually run. The downside is it's just a lot of code, and so I was thinking, you know, that can get kind of dull. I couldn't figure out how to get pictures into it, and so like there's not even pictures to help, so. I figured I'd tell one of my favorite uh, Norm McDonald jokes to sort of uh, compensate for all that. And so um, I don't know if any of you have heard the story about the frog that tried to get a loan. Uh, but it goes like this. A frog is going down the street, <coughs> and he walks into a bank, and he asks the teller, hey, I'm here. I'd, I'd really like to get a loan. And the teller's like, you're a frog. And he's like, yeah, yeah I get that a lot. Uh, but still, c can you help me? She's like, well, the loan manager, uh, uh, her name is... Uh, Patricia Wack, uh, she, you know, I'll let her know you're here, you can talk with her and she'll see what she can do. And so he waits a little bit, she opens it, Patricia opens the door, pulls her into the office and is like, uh, so I understand you're, you're looking to get a loan. And he's like, yes. And she's like, well, this is, you know, very irregular. We usually only give lo loans to humans. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I know, but c can you help me out? She's like, well, let, let's collect some information and we'll put it in and, s you know, see how it goes. And she's like, okay, so first off, uh, what's your name? And he's like, uh, kind of takes a breath, he's like, my name is Kermit. And she's like, you're not Kermit the Frog. I, I know what Kermit the Frog looks like, that's not you. He's like, yeah, 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 my, my first name is Kermit, my last name is Jagger. Um, my father was Mick Jagger. My, my mom is a frog, I'll, I'll leave that up to your imagination, but, uh, so, you know, my name is, is Kermit Jagger. And she's like, well, what do you, what do you need a loan for? And he's like, well, Miss Wack, and she's like, stop, please call me Patty. He's like, well, well Patty, uh, I, you know, I just need a bigger lily pad for my family. And she's like, okay, that's understandable. But this is still very irregular. Do, do you have any sort of collateral, any, anything at all? He's like, well, I have, I have this. And she hands over this little, like, in, little carving of an elephant. It's like pink, you know, it's, it's kind of intricate, but it's just small and wooden. And she's like, ah. Patty looks at it, she's like, I don't know what to do with this. So she takes it back to the, she's like, I'm gonna talk with my boss. She takes it back to the, the manager of the, that branch of the bank. He's like, tells her, explains, you know, the, this Kermit Jagger is trying to get a loan, but he's a frog. Uh, and this is all he has for collateral. And the manager looks at it. Oh, I see what this is. It's a knick-knack, Paddywhack. Give the frog a loan. His old man's a rolling stone. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh... <laughs> So, uh, completely differently, the Crystal programming language, <laughs> it's, um, it's a programming language, uh, it is unabashedly Ruby inspired. Uh, the syntax, the idioms and everything is, as you'll see soon, very similar to Ruby. Uh, but it's completely compiled, there's no virtual machine running the code at runtime, uh, and it's built on top of LLVM. And LLVM, uh, especially in the last years, has really become a marvelous project. Uh, it, you know, the combined work of Apple, Google, some other companies, and the, the machine code that it's able to generate and the optimizations it does is just really astounding. And um, the entire Crystal project, there's not really that many contributors. I haven't 
done all that much work with the language, like maybe 80 some commits, but I'm still like one of the bigger contributors to the language. Uh, and the reason that that's possible is one, like the, the top two people, the top three people are, are very pr proficient or prolific, uh, especially the, the main creator. Uh, but also, because LLVM is doing all of the optimizations, all the work, you can get incredibly fast programs and Crystal's more of just like a front end to LLVM. And I really think the, the next 10 years of languages, I always thought, you know, last 10 years Ruby has done, you know, dynamic languages have been phenomenal. But I always thought as computers got faster, more cores and stuff, like the languages, dynamic languages just get faster. But what it, what it seems to me is happening is the compile step on these compiled languages is just getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And, um, and so the, the foundation here of, of a language that's built on LVM, I think is going to be a dominant player in the next 10 years. If it's not Crystal, it's maybe you know, some other language uh, built on this, but I think it's the best foundations that you can have going forward. Uh, some differences from Ruby, it has all static method dispatch, uh, so there's no runtime dynamism. Once the program is compiled, it knows statically at every single call site what it's going to be. But that said, uh, you don't give up a lot of the sort of nice interfaces that you have in your Ruby programs. You still have uh, the ability to define dynamically, or not dynamically, but define, you know, programmatically getters and setters and like macros and, and so on. Um, it's all also statically typed. And this is the first language, I'm not a language connoisseur, I'm sure there's other examples of languages that have, you know, phenomenal type systems. Uh, this one just, it feels really good. Like you don't have to say types almost anywhere, it figures it all out, it does automatic unions of types, uh, which I'll show you some examples of. Uh, and then also it's very easy to link against C libraries, so you can have a nice um, ecosystem sort of ready to go. And it's also very fast. Um, micro benchmarks, you know, take them with a grain of salt, of course. Uh, but this on the left here is a crystal program with a, a, a library that's a Sinatra clone. Uh, and on the right, there's just regular Sinatra. Uh, and running it with Puma, using the, the work uh, tool to generate load, you can see it's uh, order of magnitude faster, an order of magnitude uh, less latency, and two orders of magnitude less RAM. So like, you know, this is just a micro benchmark, of course, like real applications would be very different, but this, you know, it's pretty cool. Um, it's been going on for a couple years now. Um, it became self-hosted in early on, and so that means that the, the, stand, the compiler, the standard library, the lexer, the parser, everything is in Crystal itself. And this is very cool because it makes it really easy to contribute to the project uh, itself. You know, sort of like uh, Rubinius is mostly in Ruby. Uh, this, you know, everything, is all crystal top to bottom. Um, and so now we're gonna get into the, uh, the samples. Uh, I did have to compile uh, a custom version of it because it's not quite out yet, and so I hope it works. Uh, and it just opens up this nice browser where you can do things. And so <coughs> uh, th all these codes are, samples are available. Uh, you can check it out now. You can't really use it until the next release, but it, I saw they're prepping for a release, so that should be probably in the next couple days, if not uh, tonight. And then also to go along with the theme, uh, I put in a couple uh, carpentry jokes. And so I never really wanted to be my roommate was stealing from his job as a road worker. But when I got home, all the signs were there. <laughs> and so here's similarities between Ruby and Crystal. You have uh, you know, of course, ranges here are the same. P to do a, a puts, uh, puts with inspect, turning it to an array, being able to chain methods, uh, blocks, lambdas, closures, and you know, so on and so forth. Um, this is all, you know, this code would work the exact same way in Crystal as it does in Ruby. Uh, the classes, uh, object oriented pr programming, implicit recurrent of methods, this is all, you know, very similar. Um, yeah, instance variables. Uh, also, classes are open. And so whatever the last definition overwrites, you know, the same as Ruby. And what's really cool about this is that um, the standard library is also in Crystal, as I mentioned. And so you can reach, you know, if there's something that's not quite right that you don't like about the standard library, you can reach in and modify it, and you're not gonna pay any uh, performance penalty. So if I like do this and do size, it'll say that the size is two, because there's two characters. I can reopen string. and uh, call my size on it, and you can see it, you know, 
is just there as if it were a thing. So this is you know, something that's common in Ruby, but uh, it's cool that this is here in a compiled language. Um, modules, mixins, you know, you have include, extend, so on and so forth. This is the same. Uh, but what's really cool is that common idioms work the same also. And so having question marks for Boolean methods as a convention, being able to trail uh, conditionals at the end for nice readable statements, uh, and then also you know, being able to do or equals for memoization, uh, being able to call things optionally with or without parentheses, uh, all of this is there. And what this gives you is um, overall structures of programs, how you approach solving problems in this language is the same as the experience you've built up with, with Ruby. Uh, learning the syntax or uh, properties of a new language doesn't take you know, that long, but being able to be proficient and confident in a language, that can take years and years and years. And being able to piggyback on all of that experience uh, is, a huge, is a huge boon. Uh, the spec framework is included in the standard library, and that's kind of nice too. Uh, <coughs> so how do construction workers party? They raise the roof. <laughs> so you might be thinking, so what, is this just the same thing as Ruby? Like, what's, what's the difference, what's the point? Uh, no, there's some cool differences. And so one, one thing that's um, you know, sort of, you know, it's not that different, but it is sort of a small nicety, is that <coughs> this is a, you know, would work the same in Ruby, but this sort of um, pattern of always just assigning the arguments to an instance variable, you see that a lot. It's a lot of boilerplate code. Uh, you can actually put the at signs up here, and that's just a shorthand for the same thing. So we get the same output at the bottom. Um, another difference here is instead of uh, adder accessor, it's property. It's just a different term. Uh, and what's really cool about this is, uh, just as a side, because we have a, a proper class here to show off, is you can use the tools that are as part of the language and start getting information about the class. We can see here that the greeter has two properties, a name and a citation, and there's both strings. And you can see how much uh, space this will take up on the, uh, as memory, and uh, you can see the, the hierarchy of the classes. My favorite feature, though, that is a small one but uh, very fun, is that the two proc thing is a little more powerful. Uh, so it's a period instead of a dot, and as everyone knows, that's 50% less uh, ink, so you're, you're saving stuff all already. Um, but what, what's really cool is that you can start chaining things. And so instead of just doing upcase, we can, uh, we can reverse and then upcase. Uh, you can also do things that take arguments, and so we can do split it off of every character, sort the characters, and then rejoin them, and without having to go up to uh, block syntax. And you know that's not a huge thing, but it, it, you know it's kind of nice. Uh, and I watched a documentary about how they fixed Steelwork last night. It was riveting. But the, the real big difference, aside from those sort of like superficial ones, is the type system. And so I want to spend a little time about that. And so if we look at this uh, example here, uh, we have a method that takes something and then calls the multiply method uh, with the argument of two. And so we pass in an integer here. Uh, if we ask what the type, of the, lang the type of the result is, it's going to be in 32. And this type of uh, keyword is the compile time type. Uh, the distinction of, that I'm going to make there is be made more clear later. Um, and if we pass in the string high, the type of the result is uh, string. And we can see here, just like in Ruby, it doubles the string. What actually is going on under the hood is it's creating two copies of the method, one that takes a three, or one that takes in32 as an argument, and one that takes strings as an argument. If we um, passed in uh, uh, a float, then there would be three copies of the method being made, one for each of the argument that's in the program. Uh, where it gets more interesting, though, is how the union types work. And so here's a method that instead of taking different inputs, it has different outputs. And so some of the time, it'll return the int32, and some of the time it'll return a string. And so we see over here what the return type, the type of, the compiled type is, is a union of int32 and string. Now, if we ask it what the class is, that's the runtime class. And so when we pass in something that is high enough, we get the integer out. The runtime class is int, but it's still a union type, actually. If we pass in something that's too low, the runtime type is a string, 
but it's the compile time type is still the union of the two. So let's see what, what, what happens when you have that. Um, <coughs> as we saw in the past example, both uh, integer and string I implement that times method. And so we can, this still works here. So we multiply by two, we get 30, we multiply by two, we get the string repeated twice. If, however, we try and use plus, uh, things start to go wrong. Now, what's happening here is any methods that you call downstream have to be on every member of the union type. And while there is a plus on string, there isn't one that is plus with in32 as the argument. And so this program fails to compile. This is a compile time error. Um, and so we can think here, okay, so, so what can we do about this? Well, one thing we can stop maybe our, our first thought is let's not return a string, and maybe that'll work. But now we're getting a different error. What happened here is that now we don't have a multiplication method on nil. Uh, of course, just like in Ruby, if there's no, if the condition doesn't match, it returns nil. Uh, and we didn't, ex we, you know, we, we knew that, you know, but we didn't expect it. And with this actually is a compile time error that prevents all the cases that you've seen in Ruby of like undefined method on nil. All of those sorts of errors can be checked at compile time. And some languages have special syntax for dealing with nil. What's interesting here is this just falls out of the automatic union typing that is going on here. So how do we actually deal with this? Um, so one way we can do it is say only do this if, um, if it's not nil. And so this works because any code that's inside the if, it can know that it's not gonna be evaluated at compile time and let it, let it go on through. So that's kind of nice. Uh, if you don't want to do it like that, and you, 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 you like, I know what this is going to be all the time, you can do implicit, you can do explicit casting, and that works. Uh, you can also say not nil, and this is kind of gross and long on purpose because it's to sort of discourage its use, because if you do have a mistake, and you say, oh, my, I know that this is not going to be nil, now you get a runtime error, and then you, you, you lose all of those advantages of the type system. Uh, but what's really cool about this is nowhere in here, except for this implicit casting at the bottom, were we talking about any types. It just figured them all out at, at compile time. And um, some people say, oh, yeah, so it's optional typing. And it's not, I, I, I don't know my terminology, I'm not a, a language um, expert, but I would say it's not optional typing. Because uh, the languages I see that do that, they don't care either way, they just, you give up um, the constraints if you don't say the type. This, everything is always typed, you just don't have to say it. Inference, type inference, yeah. No, thank you. Um, another cool thing you can do is um, method overloading. Uh, so this is a very contrived example, but it's not that uncommon from some you know, methods in uh, active record and such, which you know, split off the arguments that you give it uh, and do some assertions. So this is you know, you know, fairly contrived, admittedly, but what's cool in Crystal is you can, if you do wanna say the types, you can say the types and then it knows which method to, to go to at runtime. So one of the things here, um, so I, this should work. Like if this was in Ruby, this would work. And so we have this um, you know, uh, base class that we inherit from. And uh, you know, of course, you know, it's better to prefer um, composition over inheritance, but sometimes you use inheritance. And the reason this is failing is because uh, the compile time type here of the pet is seen to be as animal plus any of its children. Uh, but animal itself uh, does not include the talk method because it's just sort of an abstract class. And so what you can do here is uh, use the abstract keyword and that will, you, you're saying like, I will never instantiate uh, the, the base class I promise I'll never do that, and then everything works. Uh, another thing you can do if you're, you want to you know, be explicit about your interfaces, you can say abstract def talk, and this will be the same now, but if you forget to implement the talk method on one of them, it'll, compile, it'll throw an error right there, and you can see exactly what you forgot to do. The only thing that um, where you kind of, the types kind of get um, in the way a little bit is with containers. Uh, so you see here we have an array of arrays, um, and this first one, the type is array of array of the union of character and integer. 
And so if we uh, make a mistake and put them in the other order of our pairs, uh, this one still works because it's the union type inside. And we also run into all the same problems of uh, having to have a method that's on all the different types. Uh, Crystal provides a thing called uh, a tuple, uh, which is it pr present in uh, many languages, but not, it's a foreign concept in Ruby. Uh, and what this is, the type now, is an array of the tuple of in32 and character. And this is position uh, specific. And so with that, if we try and put something in backwards, that doesn't work because the tuple of type int and then car is not the same as the type of car and then tuple and int. And this one also works very fi fine because it knows that the type can only be that one type, everything compiles fine. Uh, one uh, sort of downside though of all this typing is that you can't just make an empty array because it wants to know, uh, you know the memory sizes of how to lay stuff up out in RAM. And so you either have to say of int32 uh, or as you've seen over here, this array with the parentheses, you can do it equals int32 um, array int32 new. And this is how uh, generics work in the language. If you're familiar with generics from other languages, you can define your own classes that take a parameterized type as a thing. This is bringing up my next uh, question. What nails do carpenters hate hammering? Very good. It is fingernails. So you've seen that, that getter and setters, the, uh, the property, uh, property macro. The way this is done is with uh, just code that looks like this. Um, you have a little like a uh, template language to iterate over things and so we just, for every of the names that are passed in, we do a little bit of work here because you can pass in some other things that um, are sort of inconsequential and then we um, define methods. And this is how uh, the getter can go from name and age to be the same as this. And you can do a lot of things with the macros. Uh, you can operate on the abstract, the abstract syntax tree, you can transform part of the language, it's, it's actually uh, really cool. One of the other neat things is you can shell out during compile time. And uh, so this example uh, uses backticks to shell out and get the current date. And this actually gets burned into the program. So you can see when you make it um, and run it immediately, you have the same dates. And then as you iterate it over time, the build stays the same, but the current version uh, changes as time goes on. And you can imagine really cool things you can do here. Like, um, so there isn't really an ORM for the language yet but you can imagine at compile time, it connects, looks at the schema, and then starts populating methods. Um, and so that's really cool, but also what's really cool is the kind of sharks that make good carpenters. Hammerheads, I heard someone, yeah. Also this build right here, this is thematic. So one of the things I worked on is my first project to get to learn the language was write the Postgres driver for the language. And what I was really surprised with is how easy it was to link against C code. Um, I had looked at the, the linking stuff in, in Ruby and it was kind of always off-putting with the X stick comp stuff and you have to write a lot of C. This is actually all you have to do. And so this example right here, if it works, uh, is actually linking against libpq on my machine uh, connecting to the Postgres that's running on my machine and executing a query. And this is the total amount of code start to finish that is required to do that. Uh, you say, you know, this is a lot of types right here, but you're just saying how to get stuff in and out of C, and it works. And you can say, like, uh, change it up, ask me the Postgres version that I'm running, uh, maybe generate a ugen, generate v4, generate a UUID, and all of this is executing queries on my local Postgres. And the fact that it's like this little amount of code uh, really was one of the first things that uh, impressed me about the language. Uh, looking at how the build steps work, there's a lot of different steps which are interesting but beyond the scope of this talk. You can see the linking step here and then my binary here is linking against libpq. Uh, another thing that it links against right now is libpcre for doing all the regular expressions. And this, we're not gonna go through it uh, step by step because there's a lot here but some of the other cool things about linking against C, a very common pattern is to, in a C uh, method signature, pass in a pointer to something, have it fill in the data, and then you, you deal with that. This has uh, sort of a nicety to take care of that for you and instantiate a new variable, and it also works with instance variables. So this actually right here is the entire method for running a regular expression. It uh, compiles the regular expression, it's, it uh, studies it, 
to make it uh, optimizations, and then here's where all the capture groups end up. And so that's pretty cool. Um, I recently had new gutters installed in my house, and the carpet decided it was on the house. I kind of beat the punchline for that one. I apologize. One of the, the things with, with performance being such a uh, key part of the language uh, that's really cool is that all the old tools of profiling uh, C code, perf on Linux, instruments on OS X, uh, work out of the box. And so these are, you, know, you can see here, here's the types, you know, the pointer class parameterized with uint8. You can see uh, individual methods being called. You don't have to worry about like instrumenting dtrace, which I have still never figured out how to do. It's really complicated. Um, and LLDB works fine. Um, all these old tools uh, just really work. You can drill down, you can see the assembly, you can see you know, where your time is being spent. Um, with all these uh, construction jokes, I was kind of worried that I would screw a lot of them up. But I really think I'm nailing it. <laughs> so there's some things that I wanted to put in here that uh, was hard to uh, put in and also uh, you know, make it make sense. Uh, just a little grab bag here is uh, structs are interesting. Uh, unlike the Ruby ones, they're actually the same as classes, except they're only allocated on, this, on the uh, stack. And so you can't change, once you create it, you can't change any of the values, but it can be much more efficient for uh, those sorts of use cases. And you can sort of, it's easy to go back and forth between the two, and you can uh, really reduce the memory footprint of your programs by using that. Um, all of the I.O. in the language is evented. Um, and a lot of the things, you saw the string interpolation earlier, what that's actually doing is creating an I.O. object and, uh, and a buffer and concatenating it in. So uh, it's actually you know, very, very performant. Uh, it's stealing some ideas from popularized by Go. Uh, so there's a, a code formatter built in that you can run as part of your editor to automatically have uh, you know, code formatted the same way across all your projects. Uh, the concurrency model is also uh, inspired by Go. It's you know, channels and coroutines. Uh, currently, though, I must admit there is no parallelism. So you can have concurrent code, but it's still only executing on one processor. Um, it's still, the language is not yet 1.0, but that's going, um, coming along. And if you're interested in installing this, uh, giving it a try, I really welcome it. If you have any questions, uh, please reach out. This uh, crystalline.org slash docs has installation instructions for Mac, Linux, what have you. And um, I, I was in a conversation last night, uh, just to, to finish things up. And we we're talking about like our home, hometowns and stuff. And I, I did grow up in a, a small town in Illinois. And um, you know, it was very, uh, you, know, you know, a few hundred, like 100 people, 120 in my class. Uh, my mom's house, there's like sheep and goats. Uh, it's a very small thing. And there's this one guy uh, who we always pinned, you know, being a small town, we pinned all our hopes and dreams on. His name was uh, Justin. And we were always like, Justin's going to go great places. And, uh, you know, he was, uh, you know, he graduated high school early. He went on to college, got a degree, Rhodes Scholar, went off to, to England. Um, but then we all lost, lost track of him and, you know, didn't hear from him for years. And I caught up with him uh, just, the other, uh, just the other couple months when I was uh, visiting Niagara Falls. And so there's like a, 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 you know, not a sea world, but some sort of aquatic uh, park there. And I, I go up and I see a guy working there, and you'll never guess who it was. It, it, was, it wasn't Justin, it was someone else. But I saw another guy, I kept walking. <laughs> and, uh, and then there I saw the, the, baby, um, the baby dolphin exhibit. There he was, like feeding the dolphins. And I said, Justin, what, what's, what's the matter with you? Like, you know, I, we always, our whole town, we, we put all our dreams on you. And I understand that that's a lot of burden to put on one person, but, you know, you're you know, feeding, you know, Dolphins, like what, you know, what went wrong? And he said, well, I, I don't know. I think you're giving me a lot of trouble. I, th I really think I'm serving a youthful porpoise. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>